Happy Sabbath and uh, good morning to everyone, especially to our students, our faculties, and also to our brethren. Today, we are going to study a topic that is most important to each of us. I entitled this topic, Lord, uh, Look Unto Jesus. And uh, there's a need for us to be looking unto Jesus. And our text will be coming from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And in verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's look at the background, uh, a little bit of the background of this Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And we know that the Hebrews during those time in Jesus' time, and of course in Paul's time, were already conquered. They were conquered by a conquering nation, which is Rome. And we know that during those time, there are also events that accompanied Rome, which are uh, we, we call it uh, Olympiad or the sports event. And uh, during the year of the sports, they would uh, continue to train themselves physically, mentally, and also spiritually. And according to the context, wherefore seeing also were compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, because during Olympiad, or should we say today, it's Olympic, um, athletes are usually preparing for the whole year. And when the event is come, they would gather about a, a cloud of witnesses from different parts and different provinces from Asia and even from Africa. They would gather together in one place to witness the event that is about to take place. And we know that the whole year, they usually, you know, um, uh, and I mean the athletes are usually preparing physically and in order to prepare for them for stamina and for the sports they would put themselves some burdens all throughout the year that they are training they put burdens and so they their their muscles will be strengthened and also their stamina will be um, strengthened but during the time of the event they would lay aside every weight and every burden, okay? They lay aside every burden. And in this text, we can, we, we can notice that in order for us to run the race, okay, in order for us to run the race, we will lay aside every weight. And then the sin which those easily beset them. See, even the athletes themselves has to deprive themselves or deny themselves of the things that they love during the time of the event. And so according to this analogy, Paul is actually taking this analogy into the spiritual realm of running the race. He says, let us run the race with what? With patience, the race that is set before us. In order for us to run, in order to us, for us to win, we have to run with patience, the, ra the race that is set before us. See if you don't have patience and then when they start running, you started a little bit earlier. The tendency is that they would disqualify you. You need to be very patient. Okay, you need to be very patient. Why? Because you might lose the event in just one second of mistake. You know, you have, you have trained yourself all throughout the year and yet you lose because of one mistake that you just did so you should not commit any mistake or any sin during that time there are rules and regulations that govern this kind of sports and different sports has different kinds of regulation different kinds of rules and you should be able to run the race with patience with endurance and also with um, consistency and uh, also with perfection and how do we run the race during this time so paul tells us that looking unto jesus as the author and finisher of our faith i thought we were the we were the athletes 
And why are we now looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? Jesus, you know, seems to be our goal. But at this time, Jesus seems to be the athlete himself. He is the starter and he is the finisher of our faith. He ran the race for us. And so when he, when he went to this earth, when he condescended to be our redeemer, he actually started the race for us. He gave himself. He followed the, the law that was required of us. And not only that, during the time of temptation, he was tempted and yet without sin. So perfectly as a substitute, he was able to follow the law for us because we, as we are weak through the flesh, we are not able to follow the law. The requirements of the law is perfection and there's no other way by which we could be saved but by being perfect. But since we are all have sinned and fall short, of the glory of God, Jesus followed perfectly the law in order for us to be merit, uh, in order for him to get the merit and give the merits to each of us. And then by following the law, he did not only just follow the law, he fulfilled the requirements of the law, which is death. See, death is required for those who have not followed the law. And since we did not follow the law, Jesus took our infirmities, took our weaknesses, and then punished it on the cross of Calvary. See, Jesus Christ was not only the author or the starter of the race. He was also the finisher of the race. So he sent the Holy Spirit in order for us to finish the race within us. What is that, what is that race? That we may witness his love. That we may witness that love to others as well. And look at this. What was the motivation of Jesus Christ during the time when he was crucified? He said, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I would say it's very amazing that his motivation was joy when he was crucified. See, when he was crucified, he already had the prize in his mind. And you are the prize, my, my dear brothers and sisters. You are his prize. He was so happy that one day you would accept him as a personal savior and that you would, he would get you and he would bring you to heaven as a pearl of great price. Today, Jesus Christ is rejoicing because he accepted you, you accepted him as his personal savior, as he had accepted you just as you are, sinner as you are. And then, the joy that was set before him endured the cross and he did not only endure the cross, he despised the shame. No matter what the shame, you know, when Jesus Christ was crucified, he was totally naked. When I say totally naked, this is 100% naked without any clothing whatsoever. He was shamed. He was naked that he may clothe us with his righteousness. He became sin for us who do not know sin, that we may become the righteousness of God in Christ who actually knew sin. See, how did it happen? We call this substitution. And so you don't need to run the race. You just need to look unto Jesus who ran the race for you. He won the race for you. You did, you, does, you, you do not you know, anymore have to run your own race because God is at work within you in Philippians chapter 2 verse 13. God is at work within you both to will and to do his good pleasure. See, God is working within you. It is him who is actually working within you, the Holy Spirit bidding you, wooing you to heaven. But sometimes, you know, we are drawn towards other things. Instead of looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Satan, you know, instigates something so that we would not look unto Jesus. Steps to Christ, page 71, says, When the mind dwells upon self, it is turned away from Christ. See, when you think about yourself, when you're so self-conscious, whether you're sinning or not sinning, instead of looking at whether Christ has already finished it for you, then you would be motivated that it is God who worked, who will work, and who, is, who continues to work for you. You forget about it. You thought that it is you who is fighting it by yourself. See, when the mind dwells upon self, it is turned away from Christ, the source of strength and life. See, the source of our strength, even our obedience, should be Christ, not ourselves. 
sometimes we think that you know I, I, I don't think I could overcome this because the word is I could overcome this instead of I think Christ is able to overcome this for me he has overcome it many years ago I mean 2,000 years ago he is the same God who will call overcoming as long as I surrender to him H hence it is Satan's constant effort to keep the attention diverted from the Savior and thus prevent the union and communion of the soul with Christ see Satan wants to divert your eyes from Christ to you know to something else <laughs> and this is the problem the pleasures these are the examples the pleasures of this world life scares and perplexities and the sorrows the faults of others you know and your own faults and imperfections to any or even all of these he will seek to divert your mind see pleasures these are temptations life scares these are trials perplexities trials sorrows even the faults of others when you look constantly on the faults of others you are being drawn away from Christ and even as you look at yourself you are drawn away from Christ looking at your own faults and perplexities and imperfections are also diversionary tactics of the devil not only that uh, you know continues on steps of Christ page 71 says do not be misled by his devices many who are really conscientious who desire to live for God he too often leads to dwell upon their own faults and weaknesses and thus by separating them from Christ he hopes to gain the victory so when when he separates you from God then you walk by yourself see don't go ahead of Jesus Christ because when you go ahead of Jesus Christ you will face Satan alone and Satan discourages you he is the accuser of the brethren who accuses the brethren day and night and how do you say how do you overcome him by the blood of the lamb by the word of their testimony if you are separated from Jesus Christ if you are so selfish that you love yourself rather than not loving yourselves as to shrink from death according to revelation chapter 12 verse 10 11 and 12. see in order for us to overcome him we must constantly look at the lamb of god that takes away the sins of the world instead of looking how we could obey or how how we could impress him or how we could overcome satan we cannot overcome satan but christ has already overcome satan 2,000 years ago and even now he continues to gain the victory but if we are separated from Christ he gains the victory we should not make self the center and indulge anxiety and a fear as to whether we are saved all this turns the soul away from the source of our strength commit the keeping of your soul to God and trust in him according to steps to christ page 71 commit the keeping of your soul don't think about you know don't be anxious about whether christ has saved you just trust in his saving grace because salvation is not about yourself it's not about what you have done it's not about what you are doing or it's not even about what you will be doing it's about what he has done it's about what he is doing and it is all about what he will do trust in the merits of christ Trust in the working of the Holy Spirit and trust in what the Lord is about to do for you. In, uh, in fact, Steps of Christ, page 71, ends with talk and think of Jesus. See, talk and think of Jesus. Let self be lost in Him. Martin Luther said, if I look at myself, I could not imagine how I could be saved. But when I look at Christ, I could not imagine how could I be lost. See, if you think and if you talk about Jesus, how could you be lost? If you think and talk of Jesus, how could you be lost? You could never be lost. But let self be lost in Him. Let yourself lose yourself that you may not be lost in Jesus Christ. You might be lost from yourself, but not on Jesus Christ. You know, let me tell you, sometimes you, you judge others, but what they have done. But, but you judge yourself on a double standard. You judge yourself on what you are able to do in the future. But do you know that Jesus judges you in a different way? Jesus judges you of what he, is, he has done what he is doing 
and what he will be able to do for you and through you. This is his judgment. And sometimes, you know, we are turned away from Jesus because we think that it's what I have done, it's what about I am doing, and what I will be doing. It's not about that. And even as you judge your fellow men, do not judge them in that way. Look at them in the eyes of Jesus, covered by the, la the, the blood of the Lamb. In uh, General Conference Bulletin, April 23, 1901, she wrote, We are not to be anxious about what Christ and God think of us. We should not be anxious about what God and Christ think of us, think of us but what God thinks of Christ, our substitute. What is the, the Father thinking about me? No. What is the Father thinking about Christ, my substitute? If you abide in Jesus Christ, you don't need to worry. You don't need to worry. Ye are accepted in the Beloved. Ye are accepted in the Beloved, not because of who you are, not whether you are worthy or not, but because He whom you dwell and trust is worthy, is worthy. See what the 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 to 5 says, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. Our weapons is not by, by fighting. Our weapons is by losing we gain the victory. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that set itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take our thoughts captive, every thought to make it obedient to Christ. This is our weapon. Our weapon is to be obedient to Christ. Our weapon is to captivate our mind on Jesus, is to be imprisoned, enslaved, in the thinking of Jesus Christ. This is how we win the fight. This is not by doing this or doing that. See how the apostles was willing to pierce, you know, the ears of the soldiers. But Jesus Christ said, am I going to fight? Okay, those who fight by the sword will perish by the sword. So Jesus Christ is like, no, surrender. By surrendering, you win the fight. And this is how Jesus Christ won the fight. You know, the more you strive, the more you fight, the more you do, you know, your best, the more you're frustrated. Why? Because it's all selfishness. It's all gaining, 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 instead of just losing and let Jesus Christ reign so that His character may be revealed love, peace, joy, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and all of this are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit will only live within you when you die. When you die of self, He will live. And when He lives, you become a blessing to others. And how do you become a blessing to others? By being humble. By not loving yourself. But by, you know, constantly losing in order for others to gain. This is how, this is how we win. Win by looking at Jesus. But there are four diversionary tactics of the devil in order to turn us away from Christ. Look at this. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 to 14, it says, I do not count myself apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is in Philippians 3, verse 12 to 14. We notice that in this verse, we have to forget what is behind. Have you ever tried to ride a bicycle looking behind? And what would happen to you if you ride a bicycle constantly looking behind? You get yourself an accident. Okay? Why? Because it's dangerous. But sometimes, how many times do we look behind, constantly thinking of what happened in the past? Instead of pressing towards the goal, the prize, who is Jesus Christ himself, looking at Jesus as our prize. But we don't constantly think about this. You know, Peter Williams talking about moral and psychological guilt. Moral guilt is your sin against God. Psychological guilt is your sin against yourself and your sin against your fellow men. But guilt is actually an, an, an anger directed at yourself, at ourselves, at what we did or we did not do. 
that's anger you know i have not done this you know i've done this and so you regret it and then you are guilty of it and those are all in the past and what else resentment are anger directed at others or what they did or what they neglected to do for you and all of these are actually impasses you know unfinished business that makes our life so burdened and so down why because we continue to cherish the past instead of moving on to the towards the future that's why the bible says in colossians chapter 2 verse 10 so you also are complete through the union with christ when you are united with christ you are complete you are perfect and have need of nothing but you must be empty before you be perfect before perfectly christ can own you when you don't own yourself anymore when you're broken Christ is near to the brokenhearted, according to Psalms. When you're nothing, Christ will cover you with His righteousness. But when you think yourself as high, then God cannot help you. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3 says, For you died. You need to die, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. In order to be hidden in Christ, you must die first of yourself. And so forget of, of the past because you're already dead looking towards the future because you are already alive in Christ Jesus, clothed by the blood of the Lamb and in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not according to your own righteousness, which is by the keeping of the law. Second, don't look ahead. So first, don't look behind. Second, don't look ahead. In Luke chapter 21, verse 26 says, Men's heart failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. See, sometimes, you know, this COVID-19, it brings so much fear within us because what, of, what is about to happen in the future? The mark of the beast, the persecution, so on and so forth. And then we lose sight of Jesus Christ. Instead of looking at Christ, we are looking at the crisis. And then we forget about Jesus Christ. This is another diversionary tactics of the devil. According to Selected Messages, Volume 1, 179 says, You will take passages in the testimonies and then speak of the close probation, of the shaking among God's people. And you will talk of the coming out from these people of a purer, holier people that will arise. Now, all this pleases the enemy. Why? You talk about what is going to happen. Oh, we'll study about Revelation, but, but you don't study about Jesus Christ in the Revelation. You talk about persecution. You talk about the mark of the beast. You talk about all of this. These are all good, but missing the point of Jesus to encourage you that He loves you so much that His righteousness is there to cover you and that He will save you won't do any good. Instead, now all this pleases the enemy. All of this pleases the enemy, according to selected messages. Why? Because he puts fear within you, and then you wanted to go to heaven because you fear of hell. And you wanted to have fire insurance, you know, have to fi fire insurance. So in order to, you know, in order to, to uh, motivate people to come to Jesus Christ, we terrorize them with plagues. And when they're terrorized, they wanted to be baptized. Why? Because they fear that they would go to hell. We don't go to heaven because of fear. We go to heaven because we feel the love of Jesus reigning and overshadowing over us and the joy that is set before us, you know, that we, we are willing to despise the shame and not only that, to suffer persecution for Jesus. Why? Because we are so happy that it doesn't anymore affect us. You know, Mark Finley once said when I attended in a camp meeting with him, many are obsessed with the fear of the future of what might happen. They are obsessed with the time of trouble so that their whole life is a life of trouble. They also like to trouble others. They are not satisfied until all is in trouble. Such are the kind of people who have lost their eyes upon the fear of what lies ahead. They become sick and dying, worry kills, and does not add a day to your life expectancy. You know, I've been receiving a lot of, you know, YouTube links and many questions, and they constantly, constantly think about the fear of the future. 
and they forget the point. This is what was happening during the time of, you know, the apostles because they constantly think about the death of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the death of Jesus. They were not able to recognize that Jesus was already walking with them. Even the resurrection, they doubted. This could have been the happiest day of their life, but until the, 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 the whole Sunday, until the night, they were still so sad instead of celebrating what was already talked about. Even the Pharisees and the, the, the scribes, you know, the priests knew that Jesus Christ would be resurrected the third day. And so they guarded the tomb. And yet they missed the point. Why? They constantly look and they're blinded with their sorrow. They're blinded with their fear that they were not able to know that perfect love casteth away fear. If you have the perfect love of Jesus, if you see him on the cross of Calvary dying for you, then certainly this is an opportunity to glorify God. Amen? This is an opportunity to glorify God. Another diversionary tactic of the devil is criticizing others or comparing. Don't look beside. So don't look behind, don't look ahead, don't look beside. See, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says, For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they are measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. If you compare yourselves among others, you know, your standard becomes yourself instead of Jesus Christ. What becomes of you? You become so dissatisfied with others or you become so arrogant and so proud of yourself that you don't see your own maladies and you don't seem to sacrifice anymore. Then I would say you would be a failure. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, do not judge and criticize and condemn others so that you may not be judged and criticized and condemned yourself. You know, this is the problem. If you keep on judging others, the measure you use others, you also measure it to yourself. And when you measure it to yourself, most probably you'll be discouraged. That's why others would commit suicide. Why? Because after proving that they are worse than others, then they get their value on what they have done or what others have done instead of what Christ has done or what Christ will continue to do or is doing for you. That is our value. Our value comes from what the Lord has given or what the Lord is about to give rather than what we are able to give to the Lord. These are all diversionary tactics. These, these are all wrong thinking. According to Signs of the Times, June 18, 1902, it says, Do not entertain the thought that because you have made mistakes, because your life has been darkened by errors, your Heavenly Father does not love you and will not hear you when you pray. This is wrong. Because he says, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. The Lord is calling you and whoever you are, whatever you have done in your life, Jesus is willing to receive you as long as you're willing to come to him and the lord is very pitiful and tender of uh, tender of mercy of tender mercy his heart of love is touched by your own sorrows and even by the utterance of them as you speak you know these these words of your own weakness jesus accept you because when you are weak god's strength is made perfect take to him everything that perplexes the mind Nothing is too great for him to bear, for he holds up worlds. He rules over the affairs of the universe. And what are you? You are just a speck of a dust. And you are so small, you know, you are so small. And what, it is, what is it for the Lord not to give you a space there if you're so small? By grace, we were created by the dust. You know, he remembers us that we are from the dust. Therefore, he takes us by his grace. It was grace that created us and it, was, it will be the same grace that will save us. Not because we deserve. Does the dust deserve anything? No. <laughs> you just need to recognize that you are from the dust. Then you are saved. But when you, you think yourself as something, or sometimes even higher than God himself, then God is not able to save you. Why? Because you are a threat to heaven. 
Why is it a threat to heaven? You will still be proud and you will destroy heaven with your own wisdom. And your wisdom is not enough to sustain your life or to sustain the life of others. Nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read, great for him, too great for him to bear. He holds up the worlds. He rules over the affairs of the universe. Nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. Everything is noticeable to God. Jesus knows your weakness. Jesus knows the deepest thoughts of your mind and he accepts you just as you are. Do you accept him also? But sometimes, you know, we're too proud as if God is a small man and we are a great person. But I would tell you today that it is your opportunity to accept Christ rather than thinking about yourself. Think about Christ. Think about Christ. Another uh, diversionary tactic is this. Don't look within. See, don't look ahead. Don't, don't look behind. Don't look ahead. Don't look beside. And also, don't look within. 1 John chapter 3, verse 20 says, For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart, and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. See, that's why our confidence is that Jesus Christ accepts us just as we are. Even though we are so small, the universe is so wide that the Lord is able to manage them and He could manage you. If He could change the whole world, He could change you as well. If by His words, He was able to create the worlds, by the same word, He's able to recreate you into His likeness, into His likeness. Okay, now, the inspired writing also said, Our Savior claims all there is of us. He asks our first and holiest thoughts, our purest and most intense affection. He wants you to think about His love. He wants to get your love as well. He's thirsting for you, for your love, for your recognition. If we are indeed partakers of that divine nature, His praises will be continually in our hearts upon our lips. Why? Because of His love. It's not about our love for Him. It's about His love for us. Our love for Him is just the response of His love for us. That's why the Apostle Paul exclaimed in Romans chapter 8, verse 30, 37, says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us that neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Why? Because we are more than conquerors with Christ. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He is the one who is racing. He, has, he, he was the one who raced for us and He will be the one who will finish the race for you. Do you accept this as truth? Do you accept this as your own victory? Or do you continue to fight and not surrender? Today, it's not fighting that we need. It is surrender. Because sometimes, you know, God, you know, waits that you fall so that by falling, you will rise again, not by your own strength, but by His strength. Let's recognize, according to Romans chapter 6, 7, verse 10 to 11, let's recognize this. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. For sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, deceived me and through the commandment put me to death. I, I, I thought that the commandment was given to give life. No! Yes, it was originally a commandment to give life and yet because all have sinned, it brought death. It killed us so that we would be destitute enough to find where life comes and life does not come from keeping the commandment. We know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And because of sin, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Amen. So that we would try to see that because we are guilty of sin, we needed to have that grace. See, the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, the law was brought in that the trespasses might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more. For the wages of sin is death, 
but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. This is in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. We should recognize that the, 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 the law was given so that sin might be, might be seen as sin. See, that you may be guilty before God, but your guilt that kills you is not able to crush you or discourage you, but enables you to know your need of a Savior, Jesus Christ. And so when you know that you're already dead because of your trespasses, you long for that life that comes from Jesus. And by knowing Jesus, you might have eternal life free. See, free from guilt, free from sin. Because Jesus Christ has already given his life for you. And because of that, that leads you from guilt to grace to gratitude. And what is gratitude? According to Romans chapter 7, verse 24 to 25, what a wretched man that I am. And who will rescue me from this, from this body of death that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ. See, thanksgiving real gratitude comes when you know that you do not deserve the grace. And yet the grace was given to you despite of your being so guilty that you exclaim that for eternity you cannot outpay God, you cannot outlove God, you will always serve God despite of your nothingness. See, we are dust from the beginning. We were dust at the very start. It was by grace that God created us. It was the same grace that sustained us and even restored us to eternal life. And this grace brings us gratitude. See, there were 10 lepers, but only one came with gratitude. Why? Because only one was a Samaritan. And the Samaritan never had that sense of entitlement that, you know, I deserve, I deserve, I deserve. He does not deserve. And yet, Christ, you know, gave him that life that he needed. And so, uh, we, we go to heaven not because we deserve. We go to heaven because God is worthy. God is good, not because we are good. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, it says, For my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, something I learned in this life is that when we are weak, we are strong. Why? Because our greatest strength is in our weakness. Why? Because when we are weak, we lean on God rather than our own wisdom, rather than our own strength. Sometimes our skills, our knowledge, our education, our position, our possession, all of these are actually a snare because we tend to lean on them. And by leaning on them, we do not lean on God. That's why we fall every time we fall. The Lord allows us to fall so that when we are broken, He is able. When we are fallen, He is able to rise us up, not from our own strength, but from His strength. And because of that, we are so much of a gratitude to God that we worship God truly. Those who have not backslidden, those who have never seen their weaknesses would never worship God because they, have to, they, are, they tend to worship themselves. They go to church because they deserve it. They go to church because they're good. Our goodness is not the way to worship God. It is His goodness that we worship God and we do good, not because we are good, but because God is good. Signs of the Times, August 8, 1892 says, But you say, the surrender of all my idols will break my heart. How would I surrender myself? See, the only way to win is to surrender. This is what is needed in giving up all for God. You fall upon the rock and are broken. Give up all for Him without delay. For unless you are broken, you are worthless. So sometimes God would allow us to be broken into pieces so that when we are broken into pieces and we have nothing anymore, to brag or to boast against God. God will pick us up so that when we are whole again, we do not credit anything to ourselves. It is by the merits of the blood of Christ that we worship Him. Today, real worshiper, worship God because He is true. Worship God because He is good. And we do good, not because we are good, but because God is good. Today, we are, have again another opportunity to fix our eyes on Jesus. Never to look back. Never to look so much ahead. Not, never even to look beside or look within. Today it is our opportunity, our privilege to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who run the race for us. And if you want to accept Christ again as your personal Savior today, Jesus Christ is willing, ever willing to accept you 
and he will not deny you because he will not, not he, he who comes to him in no wise he will not cast out and today this is another opportunity for us to submit ourselves and surrender ourselves to him what a joy that is set before us that we are even willing to die for Christ not because we are losing but because by dying we win may the Lord victorious gracious and loving continue to dwell within you today God bless you.